my name is Rid Lewis. I'm um, I'm from the School of Maths in Cardiff University. I um, specialise in operations research. This is my first um, foray into geographical information sciences. Um, so I hope I get the tone right, but feel free to ask lots of questions and things. Um, so what I'm looking at here is an operational research problem which involves um, finding paths of fixed length through um, through a map, basically, or well, or through any, or any particular graph. So um, if you let me just sorry, I'm just fiddling with my screen a second. If you um, consider the following um, diagrams, we've got um, oops, sorry. We've got um, uh, some example maps here. So let's say uh, I come home from work and my um, smartphone is telling me on my on my smartwatch is telling me that I still need to do an extra three kilometers of walk to do my allocated number of steps. So I, I'd like to be able to maybe work out a route where, where, where I could where, where I could do that. Or, or let's say I'm in a new area and I want to go for a five kilometer jog. Um, how can I figure out how to do that? Well, um, one way, of course, is just to um, is just to find somewhere that's uh, half the distance away from where you are, and then just run to that uh, point and then back again. Um, let me just get a pointer onto the screen. So here, for example, there's the centre of Cardiff. I find somewhere in, on the other side of the park, which is 2.5 kilometres away, and running running to that point and back again will get me a five kilometre run. However, I would sort of suggest to you maybe that's not a particularly attractive way of doing things. Maybe it, it would be better to do something like this, where here's a Central Park in Manhattan Island, and you know we might do a nice little lap of that. Uh, be a bit more interesting. Okay, so um, so here are some examples uh, from the methods that I, I'm going to go through with you soon. Um, this is uh, trying to find. Um, a five kilometer route and uh, an eight kilometer route from Times Square uh, in Manhattan Island. So the, the eight kilometer route you can see goes to Central Park, has goes follows some windy paths. But in general, these um, these routes are quite sort of squarey and uh, lots of turnings. But uh, although they might not look the most logical, they are actually the closest you can get to um, eight kilometer and five kilometers from from that point from the start from that starting point. Okay, so um, I've come at this from a graph theoretic point of view, because that's what my research is in. Um, so these can obviously, graphs, weighted graphs can obviously be used for, to, to generate, to, to de um, represent maps. So what we have is a graph with a vertex set and an edge set. And we say we've got N vertices and M edges. And uh, what we want to do is we're given a particular vertex as a start and end point, And we want to find a circuit that goes that follows certain edges ends up back at the start point and that has the correct sum of the weights of the edges so there's some um, terms here a, a circuit is known as um, basically a route around the graph which starts and ends at the same point and doesn't use an edge more than once so you can see for example if i was following this i would get to here and then i would go down here and then i would come back to the same uh, node or intersection on the map and then end. So that's a circuit. And um, we'd also have cycles where we can make the requirements like a little bit stricter. Well, that means we're not allowed to visit uh, vertices more than once as well. So maybe that might be a slightly more logical looking. Um, what I'm also considering at this point, I should note, is um, I'm only looking at edge weighted graphs that are symmetric. So uh the, the the edges don't have directions on them that's my current research so that's fine for things like walking paths running paths and things like that but obviously that doesn't work for if you have one-way streets and things like that on your map um i think things could be adapted to that but I, i'm not at that point yet so what's the problem definition so we're given an undirected edge weighted graph a source vertex s which is where we're going to start and end and we have a required length k and we just want to determine a circuit containing the start point uh, with a length close to, but not exceeding K. Okay, so I've stuck to this definition here of not exceeding K. 
in reality, if we wanted a five kilometer run, we might be happy with a five kilometer and 10 meter run, let's say, or we might be happy with just under. Again, this is just a simple, it's a simplification, but we could change that to allow us to exceed that um, target as well. So in terms of uh, algorithms for solving um, this sort of problem, well, uh, we run into some difficulties because uh, basically this, this problem is uh, known as what we call an NP complete problem. Um, it basically means we can't hope to solve the problem and get the best solution uh, in reasonable time. What we have to do is rely on heuristics or meta heuristics and basically approximation algorithms, which will give us uh, a solution which is hopefully good enough for practical use, but isn't necessarily going to be the, uh, the best possible solution. And uh, you can see that result from just by just noting that these gen the, the problem we're looking at here generalizes um, some classical graph theoretic problems like finding Hamiltonian cycles and graphs and finding Eulerian cycles and graphs and things like that. So the main takeaway from this slide is that we need a heuristic to do, to, to achieve this task, to accomplish this task. Okay, so, um, so the first idea I had with this uh, was to uh, use pairs of shortest paths between um, two points. So if we have two points here, here's our starting point S and uh, an end point T, we generate two shortest paths between them, and then we can combine those um, paths to form a circuit. That all seems fairly simple. Um, so if we have that, well, we can we can put that into an algorithm and just sort of all we need all we do is we basically try every single vertex as a target. So we take a target T, uh, generate two paths between them, and um, evaluate the sum of those two paths. And if that equals K, then we're fine. Otherwise we keep going and we try other, other ones and we just go through them all. So a very, very intuitive um, algorithm there. So we have some questions now about how do we form paths between two vertices in a graph? Well, there's lots of ways of doing this. We can use uh, standard algorithms like breadth first search and depth first search. But generally, these don't, in terms of maps, these don't really have any sort of uh, strategy in, in terms of picking logical uh, paths. They can end up winding all over the place. So they don't seem to make much sense. So instead, I'm focusing on shortest paths. So what we have is a, a, a vertex S, S and a vertex T. We've determined the two shortest paths between them, and then we combine that to make a cycle. So basically, in the worst case, we have to run a shortest path algorithm n times. And as I'll show you in a minute, the shortest path problem involves negative edged weights, negative weighted edges, sorry. So we have to employ the Bellman forward algorithm, which is order n to the m. So if we do that n time, we end up with order n squared m complexity, which is quite high. But I, I hope you will, I hope I'll convince you in a few minutes, even though that's quite high worst case complexity. Um, it can, we can actually get some quite quick run times. Okay, so just a quick primer on how we uh, determine pairs of paths between two points. Say I've got a small graph here and I determine the shortest path between S and T. You might think then what we can do is just remove that path from this graph here and then find another path from S to T. But that doesn't always work because as you can see here, I've extracted the path and I end up with a disjoint, a, a disconnected graph with no path between S and T. So that isn't always going to work. However, there are methods that work, such as those of Bandrai, um, where you basically generate a shortest path between S and T. You then modify the graph according to that path by negating the weights on some of the edges and reversing the directions. Then you generate a shortest path in this new graph. So that's the red one here. And then you concatenate the two and do a few other little tricks, and you end up with basically uh, two edge disjoint paths between S and T. So we've got two point paths here from S to T, and we can combine those to form a circuit. Okay, so I did say to you about the worst case run times of this algorithm, and this can be improved a lot by making note of a few things. 
So firstly, if I'm looking for a, a, a circuit in the map of length k, then firstly I can get rid of all vertices that are more than uh, k over two distance units from the source. So here, for example, is a map of the um, central business district of uh, Melbourne. And this circle might represent a three kilometer radius between from the source. And if I'm going for a six kilometer run, I only really need to consider this bit within the yellow circle. It's not quite as simple as that. It's not a circle. It's actually what we would form as a uh, shortest path tree from S, but it's a similar sort of concept. So basically what this means is uh, we're using small values of K, they result in small graphs. Um, there's also a lot of filtering we can do with these algorithms. So I mentioned that what we're doing is going through every vertex and determining a shortest path from S to that vertex. Well, actually, we don't need to consider all vertices. A lot of them can be filtered out as we go along, which means, uh, well, we drastically reduce the run times and the computational effort. And we can also use heuristic selection to um, prioritize um, vertices that might be the correct sort of distance from S, resulting in better solutions earlier on in the run. OK, so um, I'm going to show you some results from that. Um, algorithm in a second. Um, I did do some work with real world maps, but I wanted to be able to control certain aspects of the problem instances. So I came up with a little problem instance generator for generating planar graphs, which are supposed to sort of um, approximate maps. So a planar graph is just a graph that uh, can be drawn so that none of the vertices, none of the edges cross. So you can do that by, you take a square and you generate a whole bunch of points on it. You then uh, create a Delaney triangulation of that. Um, you then take a subset of the edges from here to form a spanning tree. So this gives us a uh, connected graph. And then you can add uh, edges from step two to give you a planar graph of the correct density. So this is a sort of a way of producing pseudo maps that where you can control the size and the density of them. OK, so um, here is some example results of the algorithm I just went through. Um, so basically what I did is I generated planar graphs, which were 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, and I um, uh, generated uh, 40,000 vertices within them. And then I, from that, you can generate different density graphs. So I've, I've just got here 50,000 edges and 100,000 edges. The reason I came up with these numbers, I wasn't really sure what to do here. So I basically just um, did an analysis uh, of some city centers around the world in Asia, Australia, uh, the UK, and saw that in general, if you went to the center of those cities and took a 10, by, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer square, you would generally see about 40,000 intersections. Uh, so that's the only reason I did that. Um, but basically what you can see here, even with these large graphs, the run times of the algorithm are fairly small. You know, we're talking 5, 10, 15 seconds, depending on what heuristics you're using. Uh, this line here is the best one. It's basically saying that you're calculating paths uh, between the source and the furthest vertices first. OK, so. Uh, oh yeah, one other thing. Um, this is the same set of experiments, it's just to show the accuracy of the algorithm. So what we've got here is a gap between K and the best solution seen and a success rate. And the thing to notice here is that um, when K is small, we have a small map, uh, a small graph, and therefore the accuracy tends to be um, worse because um, there is less uh, pairs of paths to go through. So there's less chance one of them is going to equal K. Uh, and then for larger maps, you, you have more choices of circuits. So you tend to get more accurate results. OK, I did, want, I did mention earlier about breadth first search and depth first search and why I use shortest path algorithms. So just to show you what's going on here, um, here is an example of small two, uh, planar graph where I've used, here I've used the shortest path algorithm to generate the two paths between source, which is down here, and a target. So this is a um, 30, uh, 30 kilometer uh, route through this planar graph. 
This is using shortest path. So as you can see, what's happening is it's identified a point up here where the short, the two shortest paths equal roughly 30,000. And as you can see, what happens with shortest paths is that the two shortest paths from that point to that point uh, run roughly in parallel to one another, which is what you kind of expect with the shortest path, right? They tend to be quite straight. Um, so whether that's a nice feature or not, I'm not so sure, but what we should compare that to is using breadth first search. What breadth first search does, it doesn't try and find the shortest paths, it finds the paths with the fewest edges. So the fewest edges in this case involves using long edges where possible. So you get a path through the planar graph, or a route through the planar graph, which maybe isn't as attractive. Okay, so, um, Another way we could approach this is to use um, local search techniques. So I'm not sure um, if people here have heard of local search techniques, but basically what we have is we start with, a, it's quite a simple optimization technique. What we do, we start with a, a, an example solution. And we then make an adjustment to that solution. And if that adjustment is seen to improve the solution, then we keep it, otherwise we reject it. And then we basically just keep doing that over and over again until we can't make any further improvements. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's just the general gist. So for example, here we have a map and here we have the starting point and here we have our current solution. Well, one way of altering this solution is to uh, select two vertices or intersections along the, the solution and uh, generate a new shortest path between them that doesn't use existing uh, edges in the solution and then just replace those. So we've just lengthened it there. So that might be one way of adjusting it. Another way might be to identify an articulation point or a bridge in the graph and extend out from that. So here we have uh, we've got an articulation point, we've extended it by performing a, uh, finding a new route here, and then we just add that in. So we just basically can do that repeatedly until we find, until we get to a solution that is acceptable for us to use. Uh, one um, issue with doing this though, is that you end up with quite messy looking solutions. So again, this is what I've got using my, the first heuristic I proposed, which is just a pair of shortest paths. So this looks quite logical. You end up with sort of two parallel lines from the source. Uh, when you use um, local search, there is no bias towards making it logical looking or aesthetically pleasing at all. So what you end up with is just a basically a zigzaggy pattern through the graph, which might actually give you a, a, a good cost but you know if i was if this was represented a map and this was my jogging route i'm not sure i'd be able to remember that so maybe that's a little bit more complicated way of doing it so i would suggest then that although this local search procedure is quite quick and um logic logical it can result in solutions which are illogical to look at okay so this is my last slide now um I just wanted to maybe talk a little bit about that last point to do with uh, trying to find visually pleasing routes. So this is where I've, I've run into difficulties because it's not really my area. Um, so I'd be happy to get any feedback here. Uh, firstly, what is an attractive route? So um, if, I'm ask, if I'm asking to go on a, to, to find a walking tour or a, or a cycle route or something, Maybe something that's sort of convex and regular in shape might look a little bit better than something that's a bit all over the place like this. Um, I can also think of issues to do with COVID safety. So when we have the stay local rules, if I wanted to go on a 10 kilometer run, it would be very useful to be able to have a, a, a route that stayed within five kilometers of my house. Um, or, or, or even closer. Um, there's also practical applications here that, you know, if I, if, I, if I have a thousand steps to complete before the end of the day and I also need to go to the shops, maybe I could get a route that could add destinations along it. Um, beyond that, there's some real world considerations here. Like um, I can imagine if I want to find a, 
a nice route through the city, I might want to avoid steep slopes. So uh, Cardiff, for example, is quite a flat city, so maybe that isn't such an issue. But if you go um, 50 kilometers down the road to Swansea, it's on the side of a hill, and you have streets here like Constitution Hill, which are very, very steep, and I wouldn't fancy running up that myself, or running down it for that matter. Um, I've also made the assumption that we want to avoid repeated edges and vertices, but I, again, I'm not really sure if that's a huge issue. Um, it certainly makes it interesting from an operational research point of view, but whether it's something that people actually care about that much in real life, I don't know. And of course, there's other things here that you can extract from maps, like prioritizing footpaths and cycle paths. So if I'm gonna introduce these into the optimization problem, I can see if I need to optimize the length of the routes as well as the sort of aesthetic quality and the convenience and safety of them, we might end up having to turn towards multi-objective optimization techniques or weighted sum functions for the objective function and, and things like that. Okay, I think that's where I'll stop for now. Thank you. So first of all, we've got um, just an idea. I think a survey to people who go jogging will provide the information you need um, to define attractiveness. Yeah, I, and I, it's something I've been thinking about, but coming from a maths background, I have never written a survey or conducted one in my life. So uh, it's something I'm a bit nervous about doing, but I totally agree with that, yeah. Um, we've also got um, not exactly a question, so I'm putting this here, but we've done research in both the A to A versus A to B circular routing and in using ML to typify good routes um, in the outdoors with Andrea Palatore. Happy to talk more. Oh, I would really, really appreciate that. Um, uh maybe would it be possible to if i if i give you if i put my email into the chat could that person who um contact me by email or something that would be really helpful thank you um also we've got have you tried methods that minimize the total angle turned might give nice rounded roots yeah again i agree um it's certainly something that can be built into things like the the local search routines you can just add it to the add it as a sort of Add it to a penalty in, in, the, in the objective function, that, that's certainly doable. Um, again, I haven't got around to the deciding what would be the best measure there. I did learn about rectangularity measures a few days ago at this conference, which is very helpful. I hadn't heard of those before, and I've since seen some other ones. But yeah, reduce, um, the sum of the some of the angles as well would be would be interesting. Um, what I would say is that the problem is as I said, NP hard. So finding the, the best possible solution is unlikely to be feasible, but we will have, we can sort of come up with some compromise between finding accurate solutions and good looking solutions in reasonable time if we do it properly. I hope we've also got, um, could an extension using machine learning with Strava data routes are rated and um, point of interest to quantify attractiveness being interesting? Um, I'm gonna, I, I don't actually know what Strava data is, I'm afraid. Um, is that something well known amongst the geographical information sciences? Um, uh, it's like an, it's Strava, it's like a runner's app. Um, I think you like, oh, right. yeah, um, okay. I think oh. it's a big thing because you can share it on social media and, and you can draw your name on your jog, oh, right. jog oh, in okay. certain shapes and okay. things like okay. that, yeah. I've not heard of it, um, but I am going to look into it because, that, again, that's that's the sort of thing feedback I was looking for from from this talk. There's another thing I might have actually read it in your paper, but um, was thinking about stuff as well, like street lighting. Would there be a way to incorporate routes that could avoid high crime areas or low lighted areas? Yes, definitely. Again, it all depends on the. Um, you know whether that data can be collected so um if you consider an edge between two points that's just a segment of street between two intersections and in a simplified way you could just sort of measure the attractiveness of that street in terms of does it have safety is it is it on a is it a steep slope 
is it flat? Is it does it have high crime? Does it have street lights? Is there grass? Is there high traffic density? And you could consider all those things separately, or you could sort of combine them all into some sort of attractiveness measure and then combine that into your optimization model. That is, yeah, definitely doable. And again, I think I mentioned about street uh, uh, safety, but I didn't actually have street lights in my mind when I said that, but actually that's a good idea. So I'll add that to my list, my to-do list. We've also got, um, you touched on this, but what about using land use data to prioritize PG parks with land for trail running? Yes, again, um, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, again, I, I don't have a lot of experience in um, analyzing, using data like that. Uh, it's, it's, but again, I would imagine if you have a path that is running through park, and that has nice street lights, for example, that would add to its attractiveness as being part of a route. And could okay, be built okay. into the objective function somehow. Oh, we just have we've got one last quick one. Um, maybe if you classify, tag your nodes as places to visit, helps you reduce the complexity. Parks are more interesting than car parks. Certainly, yeah. I mean, you could definitely just sort of start with your map and just delete streets that you don't want to ever consider. So like car parks and uh, and so forth and make your, your map a lot simpler before you start optimizing. So yeah, that was, that's a good idea as well.